Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thank you guys for joining us. This week we've got Rashidi Ellis. Plus, it's a big, big fight week. Erickson Lubin versus Sebastian Fundura. Good Lord, that's a good match. And in this week's Toe to Toe, Mike and I will list our top five 154 pounders today. So let's get right to it with the PBC Fight of the Week. This Saturday, April 9th, PBC brings you a 154-pound triple header topped off by one of the best matchups of the year thus far in the main event. Erickson Lubin and Sebastian Fundura battle for the WBC interim 154-pound title at the theater at Virgin Hotels in Las Vegas live on Showtime. TV action begins at 9 p.m. Eastern time, and we begin here with the essentials. Okay, here we go. Lubin is 24 and 1 with 17 knockouts. Fundora 18 0 and 1 with 12 knockouts. Uh, both are 5 and 0 in their last five fights with three knockouts. Last fight for Lubin was uh, his sensational sixth round knockout over Jason Rosario uh, this past June. Our uh, last June, Fundora outpointed Sergio Garcia in December. Lubin has a 68% knockout percentage, Fundora 63. Uh, Lubin's fought 110 rounds, Fundora 88, two young guys. Lubin's 26, Fundora 24. Lubin turned pro in 2013, Fundora 2016. They're both southpaws. Lubin, 5'9 and a half. Fundora, as everybody knows, 6'6. Six, six. I've seen him listed at 6'5. I know he's really tall. Uh, Lubin, <laughs> 74 and a half inch reach. Fundora 80 inch reach, which is insane for a 154 pounder. Lubin's from Orlando, Florida, and uh, Fundora and his family live in Coachella uh, in Southern California. Man, there's a lot to unpack as far as uh, uh, those essentials. But let's start with this. Let's look at the keys to victory for each fighter, beginning with Erickson Lubin. What does he have to do in order to win this fight? Okay, I think he he just needs to be smart. He needs to make Fundora uncomfortable. Lubin needs to just do his thing, fight aggressively but intelligently. I think I think Fundora is at his best when he crowds his opponents and throws those whipping punches. He's a remarkably good inside fighter given his height. Uh, Lubin, one of the best all-around offensive fighters in the business, I think. He just needs to jab, throw combinations, and move so he doesn't get trapped by Fundora. Uh, I think he can win. Clearly, if he does that, and if Fedora tries to fight from the outside, I see Lubin moving in and out and having su- success that way too. Uh, one more key: uh, Lubin needs to avoid Fedora's biggest shots. I still have questions about Lubin's chin, although I really like him as an all-around fighter. What about Fedora? What are his keys to victory? So I can say the same thing about Fedora. He needs to make Lubin uncomfortable. One way to neutralize a good athletic boxer is to smother him. Uh, again, that's right up Fundora's alley. Uh, I just stay on top of Lubin, make him fight inside, throw a lot of body shots. Uh, that could wear Lubin down and turn the fight in Fundora's favor. Uh, and as I said, Lubin could be vulnerable to a big shot. I wouldn't seek a knockout if I were Fundora, but I'd pounce if I thought I had uh, Lubin hurt at all. So in your opinion, who has the advantage in the early rounds? Probably Lubin. I think it'll be obvious from the start that Lubin is the better boxer, the better all-around fighter, and obviously that's my opinion. Uh, Fundora will have to cut off the ring, start landing those body shots with some consistency. That takes time, though, so I look for Lubin to get out pretty quickly. And what about the later rounds? Is that a little more dangerous for uh, Lubin? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know whether he's going to be able to force, Fandora is going to be able to force Lubin to fight him toe to toe. But if he can, he could have his best rounds later in the fight. That certainly isn't a given, though. I think there's a good chance that Lubin will wear Fandora down by landing the cleaner punches, by moving, by just controlling the action. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I could see that. Now, but who is the more powerful of the two? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure much separates them in that regard. Um, I guess I would lean toward Fundora, who gets a lot of leverage on his punches. I keep thinking of uh, Nathaniel Gallimore, who went the distance with Lubin but was stopped by Fundora, but that might not mean anything. You just It's hard to compare fights. Uh, Lubin has power, too. I know, as I said, I think they're both have better than average power, maybe not great punchers, but good punchers. Uh, yeah. it's, really, it's really a push. Yeah, I, I mean, I think either one can take the other out. Um, so definitely both have good power. How do you see the fight playing out? Who's going to win this? Well, I think it's essentially a 50-50 matchup, which is what the odds makers think too. Uh, but I lean toward Lubin. Uh, again, I think he's the better all-around fighter. I think he'll do his thing offensively and not stand still long enough for Fedora to get into a groove, at least not consistently. Uh, I think he'll outbox Fedora, land the cleaner, more eye-catching shots, and generally be the ring general. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, though. One, he can't just stand in exchange with Fundora toe-to-toe. That plays into F- Fundora's hands. And once more, I think Fundora can hurt him with the right punch. Uh, I'm going to say Lubin by unanimous decision. Yeah, you know, I keep wavering on this, especially the closer it gets to the fight. I I don't know. Uh, I feel this could go either way. I, there are a number of different scenarios I, I've played out in my head, but I'm with you. I like Lubin here. Uh, by unanimous decision, maybe even by stoppage, because I, I do believe he will be aggressive. I believe he's a better boxer, and that should allow him to land his uh, his power shots first. Now, in the co-feature, co- former unified 154-pound champ Tony Harrison takes on Sergio Garcia. Mike, last time we saw Harrison was one year ago, a draw against Brian Perella. Not his best performance, but Harrison had a lot going on. His first fight without his late father in his corner, obviously ballooned in weight a little bit. What was your take on Harrison that night? I would say his performance was uncharacteristic. Uh, as you just mentioned, it was his first fight without his dad, and who was also who was also his trainer in his corner. Ali Salam had passed away about a year earlier. Uh, he looked a little lost to me. He threw a lot of jabs. He moved a lot, but he didn't do much of anything else at all. Uh, my gut tells me that he just wasn't in a good place mentally. Uh, although I want to give Perella uh, credit, though, too. He's a good boxer. Uh, he performed well, actually scored at seven rounds to five for Perella, but uh, Harrison just didn't look right to me in that fight. Now, what about his opponent, Sergio Garcia? Uh, he's coming off a, a loss, his first loss last December, unanimous decision to Sebastian Fundura, uh, but I thought he put up a good performance. W- what did you think? Yeah, I agree, especially in the first half of the fight. Uh, this sort of goes against what I said about Fundora earlier, uh, but Garcia had success against him by staying in his face. Uh, Fundora uh, actually address, adjusted well. You know, he created space to throw and land punches by jabbing, countering, stepping back, whatever he had to do. Uh, so sort of an opposite, it was an opposite situation to the way I think the Lubin fight's going to play out. Uh, anyway, Gar- Garcia sort of faded in the second half of the fight a little bit, or at least uh, Fundora took control of the fight. But overall, it was a pretty good performance. Yeah, it was. Now, why is this fight so important for each boxer? Well, first, both guys are coming off fights they didn't win. They can't afford another setback. But I think the fight is particularly crucial for Harrison. Uh, Remember in the fight before the Perella fight, he was holding his own in his rematch with uh, Jermel Charlo when he was stopped in the 11th round. Um, Then came came the draw with, uh, with Perella, which raised serious questions about Harrison's future as an elite fighter. Uh, he 100% cannot afford another slip up on Saturday. You know, and obviously Garcia doesn't want to lose back to back fights. I think if he does, he might be seen as sort of a gatekeeper kind of fighter. So who you, who are you picking here? Uh, so I'm basing this on what I've seen from Harrison in the past, uh, you know, which may or may not be appropriate. We'll see. Uh, he's a terrific boxer when he's on. He's one of the best around, I think. Uh, I'm going to guess that he'll be in a better frame of mind. He will have had more time to adjust, uh, you know, to a new training situation. Uh, he's going to have to endure some serious pressure from Garcia, uh, but he's, I, in my opinion, he's the much better boxer. I think I think he's going to stick and move and just outclass Garcia in the end. So I'm I'm going with Harrison by wide unanimous decision. Oh well, yeah, I, to me it's another tough fight, but like you, I, I, give me Harrison by decision here. It's a crossroads fight for him. I think you laid out why it's so important, and I I think he's going to lay it all on the line. Now, we've got a real interesting bout in the TV opener. We mentioned Brian Perella. Well, he takes on the undefeated Kevin Salgado, which of course has led everyone to ask. Who is Kevin Salgado and why are folks so high on him? Well, he comes from a boxing family. Uh, He's the younger brother of former two-time title holder Juan Salgado. 
Um, he had a pretty good amateur career by Mexican standards, something like 40 fights. He reportedly won like three national championships in Mexico as an amateur. Uh, so he can box. Uh, he has really good footwork. He's got a nice long jab. Uh, he's quick and athletic, uh, maybe more than uh, some people might realize. Uh, and he seems to have pretty good power on top of, their, of everything else, although he did go the distance in his first 10 round during his last fight. I don't know. I don't have that great of a feel for him, but he looks to me like he's a, just a real good all-around prospect. Yeah, I mean, like I said, a lot of people are really high on him. Now, we discussed how Tony Harrison looked against Brian Perello, Perello which was both of their last fights. How do you think Perello looked? Now, as I said earlier, Perello uh, has demonstrated in multiple fights that he's a slick boxer. I was surprised that Harrison didn't beat him, but I wasn't surprised at all that he was competitive. Uh, he got stopped by Abel Ramos with one second remaining uh, in their fight before the uh, before the fight with uh, Harrison, if you recall, uh, it was a little bit of a controversial ending. Right. Uh, but he was winning easily before that. And he was beating Abel Ramos fairly uh, easily, I think, which says which says something. The guy can really box. I mean, yeah, he's he's been in there with Ramos. You, you mentioned Harrison, Jordanis Ugas, Luis Colazzo. Is this too much too soon for Salgado? That's what I'm thinking. Although, again, I don't have a good enough feel for Salgado to have a strong opinion on that. Uh, I like what I see from Salgado by watching him on YouTube, but this is a pretty significant step up in opposition. This is this is only Salgado's second fight scheduled for more than eight rounds, and it's his U.S. debut. That's a lot to overcome for him. All I can say is we're going to learn a lot about Salgado on Saturday. So who wins? I'm going to guess that it is too much too soon for Salgado. I think Perella, who has you know experience in big fights, is going to be a bit too slick for his young opponent and win a close decision. Uh, Perella has been stopped a couple of times, though. I won't be shocked if Salgado catches him and hurts him. He has the power. I think this just all depends on how good Salgado is. I just don't know, but I know Perella's pretty damn good. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm going for all of my decision here. I think he looked great in his last fight, and I expect him to hold off the young line, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Now, just a reminder, in the Prediction League standings, Mike and I are both 9-4. and four. It is time to bring in our guest this week, an undefeated welterweight eager to make his ring return, the man they call Speedy, Rashidi Ellis. Uh, Rashidi, first, we want to welcome you to the PBC family. I think the uh, entire boxing world is buzzing at the news. Yes. How uh, how excited are you for this first start to your career? So I'm very excited, man. It feels like breath of fresh air, man. Finally, you know, get get back in the group. Finally, get to get back in the ring. What I love to do. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us how you connected with PBC? I got connected with these. Um, I had a lot of I had a lot of offers at different companies, and but uh, PBC was the be- was the best choice. We had the best offers and X. Um, everything I asked for, they they agreed to. So that was the that, that was the best choice. Okay, so you last fought in October 2020. You beat uh, Alexis Rocha. Uh, so tell us what happened after that fight. Um, I'm not really sure myself. Um, I was I was. I was, you know, looking for a fight. I was asking for fights. I was in the gym. I was ready to go. You got to ask Golden Boy about that. I don't, I don't know. I was always waiting. I was waiting on the phone call, calling them, waiting for a fight. They stand up to it. Now, there was talk that a, a Virgil Ortiz fight was offered to you, and, and you didn't take it. Was that the case? <laughs> yeah, that, that was bull. Cool. Uh, well, they, 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 they called me with the fight, which he already had a fight. And they offered me low money. Obviously, I was, like they knew I was gonna say no about it, and they didn't even like try to negotiate. And they just uh, basically they just said, uh, "Okay, we have somebody else." So, I don't, I, I, what was the point of the phone call? You calling me, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, how frustrating <laughs> was it for you to be on the sidelines? You know, uh, to be on the sidelines for this long? Yeah, I was. This is very frustrating, especially being in the gym, not knowing when the next time you're fighting. You know, and time passing by is. You know, I, I'm, I'm not getting younger. I'm getting older, so, you know, it's very frustrating. All right, is there any concern? So now you're coming back. Is there any concern about the long layoff? I mean, maybe in terms of rust or anything like that, or do you feel good? Oh, yeah, I feel good. I feel, I feel already. Like I said, I'm always in the gym, so yeah, I'm not worrying about that. You know, I'm ready to get in the mix with the big dogs. 
you say you're always in the gym. So what have you done specifically to uh, keep your body and your skills sharp? Do you, I'm assuming you don't spar or anything like that, but you just stay in shape. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Oh yeah, no, nah, no, nah, I still, I still spar, do all that stuff. Plus I got like a physical therapist, you know, keeping my body young, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you know, always in the gym doing pads, look on reaction, you know. Excellent. <laughs> You, uh, you you brought up the big dogs, um, and uh, I know you're eager to get in, into the mix. For the, for the fans who, who may not know your history too well, tell us about your background. You, you come from a family of, of fighters. What Who was it that uh, that first introduced you to the sport? The first person was my, my older brother. Yeah, he was, a, he was the first one excited. You know, like, yeah, him and, him and his group of friends always talk about boxing. They used to box in the basement. <laughs> and we didn't even have boxing gloves. We had like mittens. We used to put socks in it. We used to wow. we used to box in that. Yeah. Then I found I felt you know I found low. I wanted to get better. You know I felt low with it. I went to the gym. I didn't stop since. Me and my little sister went to the gym. So you talking about Ronald, uh, your older brother, or yeah, Ron, yeah, Ronald Ellis. Yeah, my little sister uh, Rashida Ellis. Now, at what point did you realize, hey, I, I could probably do this professionally? Um, the first time when I heard you could get paid, I was like, what? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> when you first started, I'm just curious, how old were you when you first started, when you guys started doing that in the basement? Um, I, I, was, I was doing that since I was like 10 or 11, but I started boxing at 12. Okay, so you've been at, you've been at it for a little while. So, yeah. so, so you mentioned Ronald and Rashida, so there's three boxers in the family. Uh, so we got to yeah. know, from your perspective, who's the best of the bunch? <laughs> I can't tell you that. You about to start a fight? Um, <laughs> well, we're all, we're all different. You know, we got our own different styles. So whatever, whatever you guys like, I can't really say. That's diplomatic. I'll I'll accept that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I can't be neutral. <laughs> there, you, there you go. So, who are some of the fighters uh, you admired growing up? Uh, there's a lot of fighters. Playing, um, but the one that really sticked out was like Roy Jones and Prince Nassim, because they made it seem like it was fun. Like, I, you just have fun doing it, so I was like, shoot, I want to try it. Uh, that's a really good answer, actually. I like that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how much of a fan you are now, but are, are there some fight, top fighters today that you like to watch that you're sort of fans of? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of great fighters, a lot of great fighters. You know, um, Boo Boo, Dimitri Andre, Andre, yeah, that's my, that's my dog right there, that's my brother. Um, obviously, Canelo. A lot of fighters, young fighters, Shakur, I like Shakur, CBC. Chris and Shields, I'm in the Toronto. I say a lot of things, right? So there's a lot of fighters out there. Yeah, I'm in the Toronto. She's good. Now, now yeah. there are a lot of fighters in the welterweight division. I mean, it's it's sizzling right now. So we want to get your take on uh, a few things. First, Saturday, April 16th, Errol Spence and your Dennis Ugas uh, battle on Showtime pay per view. What are your thoughts on that fight, and who do you expect to win? Yeah, that's gonna be a great fight. That's gonna be a tough fight. But it's like a little 50 but I'm more leading on Earl, but I don't know how he's going to come back. Cause this is his first fight back from the eye injury, I believe, right? Yeah. Right, right. So, so we'll see how that plays out. But I got Earl, because Ugo is no, no slouch. You know, he's coming to fight. What What makes you think Earl has the uh, the edge? Better better boxer. You know, he, he knows how to box. He really don't bring out the but he, like, You know, he's Olympian, so he could box, though. He, he, he showed his boxing and he went. Pacquiao. Yeah. You show, yeah. Oh, you talking about uh, Errol? Oh, uh, I talk about Errol. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uga too. That yeah, Pacquiao fight. You show he could box too. But well, I still think yeah. Errol's a better boxer. Now, the obviously the 147 pound division is one of the deepest in the sport. What will it take for Rashidi Ellis to stand out? Just, just keep on winning. You know, look good, look good while doing it. Okay, well, that sort of leads me to this then. So uh, we know you're you're itching to get back into the mix. What can we expect to see from you when you actually step through the ropes and back into the ring? Something special, man. Something, something that box has been missing. <laughs> Sounds like you're really excited. It's, uh, just, I'm guessing that you're pumped just to get get going again. Yeah, I'm very I'm smiling right now. <laughs> very excited. <laughs> Do you have a date yet, or when when you might return? Yeah, hopefully June or July. Okay. Yeah. Have they any idea who you might fight? Sure. Uh, not yet, but at this point, I really don't care who it is. <laughs> I just want to get in there. Do you feel like you need a couple, maybe a tune-up fight or two, or are you looking to jump into the big fights right away? 
I know the smart thing is to get a tune up, but I I really don't really don't believe in a tune up. I just want to I just want to get in there with with the you know with the big guy show that I'm the best in the both the division. Now there are a lot of folks online on social media who see you and Jerome Boo Tennis as the uh, the future of the division. Would you agree with that statement? And, and could you see a fight with him taking place somewhere down the line? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, um, yeah, he's a great fighter. I, be- I believe um, he's the future. But to me and him could fight fight soon. Um, I know he got to fight with Clayton, and I and I got to fight with June or July, or whatever. And then you can get in on after that. It don't matter to me. Oh, I like that. Now, it, now, last question for you, Rashidi. If you could wave a magic wand and make it happen, who would your next four opponents be? Oh, if I had magic powers, shoot. Um, <laughs> I'll probably fight the winner of Ugas and Earl, then Crawford, get that belt, and probably move up to 154, fight the winner of Charlo and Kassan. No, what, that's his name? I forgot his name. Kassan, yeah. Kassan, yeah. Yeah, shoot, probably do it again. <laughs> So you, so I mean, do you plan to stick at forty-seven for long, or are you eyeing fifty-four soon as well? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable at forty-seven. Shoot, I, I probably go down to one forty. You think so? Probably, yeah, I probably suck though, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, we are we're real glad to, to have you. We are looking forward to your return um, this summer. I'm sure, it's going to be a good one, Rashidi. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, when no once problem. we get that once we get that uh, fight announced, uh, let's get you back on again. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited about this. Thank you for the call too. Erickson Luba, nicknamed Hammer. The left hand is Jack. The right hand is Sledge. Oh, there's a beautiful one through the guard. Erickson Lubin takes aim with thunderous hands. The power of Lugan. But stopping six foot five Sebastian Fundora is a tall order. It's time. Erickson Lubin versus Sebastian Fundora for the right to challenge for the 154 pound world title live on Showtime. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. This week we're going to list our top five 154 pounders today. Currently, uh, we've got a lot to choose from, man. The division is stacked, and these guys just aren't afraid to get in the ring and duke it out. I've somehow managed to narrow down mine to five. So, Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, I just wanted to preface this by saying a couple of things. One, we did not talk at all about who we might choose or anything like that. So I have no idea who who Ken went with. Um, the second thing is I wanted to say that uh, all five of the guys that I went with will have been in action with a, within a seven-week period, and four of them will have faced someone else on the list, uh, which says to me that 154-pounders don't mess around. Uh, they really fight the best out there, at least they have the last couple months. Uh, so here goes. Number five for me is Sebastian Fundora. Uh, Fundora started out as kind of an oddity because of his height. Uh, a 154 pounder as tall as Anthony Joshua. Come on, you can't be serious. Uh, over time, though, he has proven sort of beyond doubt that he's a lot more than a curiosity. The guy can fight. Uh, and as I said earlier, he doesn't he doesn't do it in, in the way you'd expect a man his height would. He loves fighting on the inside and he's good at it. Uh, he just wins fights. You know, the draw against Jamonte Clark being the only exception. And I think he learned a lot from that fight. I think he's a better fighter after that fight. Uh, of course, he has a big hurdle to clear against Erickson Lubin. Uh, if he can win that fight, well, he'd move up on this list and every other list you could think of. Yeah, I like your uh, number five because it's the same as my number five. Um, now, look, given that there are three big 154-pound f- fights this weekend on Showtime, this list may change by the next episode. Right, I don't right. know. That's funny, um, yeah. But uh, I like Fundura in this spot, too. I thought he looked great against uh, Nathaniel Gallimore. He showed he could stand toe-to-toe against uh, Coda. He adapted and he boxed, the, uh, you know, against Garcia. I do think the uh, the Monte Clark fight was an aberration like you, but it's also led me to wonder if perhaps a better boxer can trouble him. Uh, I guess we'll see Saturday night when he faces Erickson Lubin. Indeed. All right, let's go to number four. My number four is Tim Zhu. Now, I believe Zhu is next in line for a shot at the Charlo Castagna winner. Uh, we saw what he did against Toro Goshe a few weeks ago. He got up off the canvas dominated much of the action, thought he showed guts, power, confidence, uh, still needs a little bit of work on defense. If I, I think if he expects to reach the top of the heap, but there are a lot of people who think he's already capable of doing that. Okay, so I'm starting to think that maybe this is going to be our first 
clean sweep that we end up, we may end up with the exact Let's same see. guys Let's in the see. same order. So, cause my number four is also Tim, Tim too. Um, yeah. I don't think it's clear yet exactly how good this guy is, but man, I sure like what I see so far. Uh, first, I don't, I don't think he's the typical son of a great fighter. I think I've said that before. This guy's is a fighter through and through himself. He can box, he can punch, and he seems to be driven to a real extreme degree. Uh, he just imposes his will on his opponents, even the good ones. Uh, and he proved against Terrell Gachet that he can overcome adversity, you know, getting up from a knockdown to win their fight. Uh, that says a lot to me. I think this guy is special. Uh, maybe the jury's out to a small degree, but uh, I'm excited to see what he's going gonna to do next. Yeah, so am I. And uh, I'm excited to see who your number three is, too. Who you got? I think this might be the key to whether we have the exact same guy sure. in the same order, uh, Erickson Lubin. Uh, I, I think he's the second best offensive fighter in the division, which is a big compliment. Uh, he has his natural gifts. He's speed. He's, he's athletic. He has a skill set. You know, remember, he was an outstanding amateur once at, once upon a time. Uh, and as I've alluded to, he just takes charge in the ring. He fights aggressively, which I love, but he also does it intelligently, which is my favorite kind of fighter. Uh, now, he did get stopped by Jamel Charlo in one round, which we can't just completely dismiss. He also got rocked by Terrell Gaucher late in, the, in their fight, if you recall. Uh, I do wonder about his chin. Uh, it's just it's in my mind because I've seen him. I seen him get knocked out. I've seen him get rocked. Uh, that said, I think anybody can get hurt by the right punch. I really like Lubin's all around game. Uh, I think he's uh, and I think he's on a really impressive run right now. He's really hot. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so are we, because I've got him number three as well um, for the exact same reasons. I mean, I think this guy's earned his position and he did it the the hard way, the old fashioned way. I mean, we know what happened in 2017, but let's look at what's happened since. I mean, the wins over Ishe Smith, that was a blowout, actually. Then you added Jason Rosario, which was another KON. Nathaniel Gallimore, Terrell Gaucher, that's really yeah. impressive work yeah, uh, he and uh, Coach Kevin Cunningham have put together. He's clearly earned a shot at the title, but, you know, he has that one final hurdle, uh, a pretty tall one, I might yeah. add, yeah. Uh, in uh, Sebastian Fundura on uh, Saturday night. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to Brian Castaño. <laughs> well, how do you know it's Brian Castaño? It could be – uh, yeah, it's Brian Castaño. I figured – yeah. So the guy is the guy's just a fighting machine, as we saw in the draw with uh, Jamel Charlo. Uh, I had him actually winning a razor thin decision in that fight, uh, although I think it was essentially a draw, which is the official result. Uh, his strength is that he's relentless and he outworks his opponent, so, uh, which is a product of his crazy fitness. Uh, he and Charlo threw a similar number of punches, but he threw many more power shots than Charlo, 400 to 246, according to CompuBox, which, wow. which, I, which I thought was an interesting stat. Uh, he can't punch as hard as countryman Marcos Maidana used to, uh, but he probably is a better all-around fighter, which I think says a lot about Brian Castaño. Uh, the guy has ability. He's always ready to fight. He doesn't know how to quit, uh, and that's why he's – you know, one victory away from becoming the undisputed 154 pound champion. This guy is the real deal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, he, he may not punch as hard as Maidana, but he, I think he punches pretty well. I think he's a, he's a pretty good puncher. And like you said, he's got everything else, elite boxing skills. I mean, he was a great amateur. Um, he's my number two as well. Uh, we saw what he did against Jamal Charlo last year. Of course, the uh, the win over Patrick Teixeira, the draw against Arislandi Lauer, and I find a lot of folks thought he won. To me, Kastani is just a truly, truly excellent fighter. And, of course, as you said, he'll get another chance to claim the top spot uh, when he takes on Charlo again uh, May 14th. Let's uh, let's go to number one. Should I, should I kick this one off? or Go for it. All right. My number one is Jermall. No, it's Jermall Charlo, <laughs> obviously. Um, I think his resume and his performances make him a clear number one here. The knockout of uh, Jason Rosario to unify the titles, the stoppage of Tony Harrison to win back. The title, the KO of Erickson Lubin, Jorge Cota, Austin Trout, uh, Vanez Matarosan seven years ago, uh, Gabe Rosado eight years ago. That's how extensive and impressive this man's resume is. Dennis Douglas, Demetrius Hopkins, I could go on. Honestly, if this man isn't on your pound for pound list, then I don't want to see your pound for pound list. Now, all this could change on May 14th when he faces Castaño again. Um, but I think if, you know, Jamal Charlo wins, he should not only be, uh, you know, in your top five uh, pound for pound, but I think he leaves no doubt that he's a future Hall of Famer. Yeah, this guy's been 
consistently good for a long time. You know, he's had a few slip ups, if that's what you want to call him. You know, he lost that decision to Harrison in 2018, but he came back and and stopped Harrison. Um, you know, and then the, Charlo drew with Castagna the last time out. You know, otherwise Charlo has been the most dominating fire, the, fighter in the division. I, I arguably one of the most dominating fighters ever in that division. Uh, yeah. He, you yeah. know, he, he stopped Harrison in the rematch, as I mentioned. Uh, I believe uh, making, you know, underscore my prediction. I believe he's going to beat uh, uh, Castagno in their second fight. I think I've said that before on the podcast. Uh, he can box. He's a big puncher. He has a mean, nasty quality that I think works for him. Uh, I think the only thing that has worked against him, perhaps, is that he's not always busy enough. He relies a little too much on his power sometimes, I think. Uh, if he could match or even come close to his opponent's work rate, I think he's almost untouchable. That's a really, really good point, and you know, it makes me wonder what kind of game plan he's going to have for the uh, the Castano rematch. I, that fight to me is, you know, just a great, great matchup. Uh, you know, I could those guys could fight two, yeah, three, 50, four more yeah. times. Yeah, fifty-fifty matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just love it. You know, seeing two high-level guys like uh, Charlo and Castano get it on. Now, um, that's going to do it for this week's show. Don't forget, guys, Saturday night. PBC on Showtime presents a 154-pound triple header capped off by an amazing main event, Erickson Lubin versus Sebastian Fundura. Don't miss it. We want to thank Rashidi Ellis for dropping in, and we want to thank you for listening. Be sure to check us out next week for more boxing talk right here on the PBC Podcast. 